Hi, everybody. Today, our webinar is titled Let's Get Creative. We're going to be talking about a UDL approach to distance learning in a fun way. And I'm Jenna Picotta. I'm an academic technology specialist at the Santa Clara County Office of Ed. And today, Karen Larson is my co host. And uh, I'm also here with Abby. This is a special treat that she's joining us today. So I will go through these strategies. We'll have some conversations and um, yeah, hopefully we'll be done in about 30 minutes. So I want to welcome all of you for watching and I chose this GIF because I'm just thinking about, you know, well, what's your superpower? What are those things that really get you to be that creative person that you really are? So I would like to ask Karen, what is an activity that allows you to express your creativity? Well, one of my hobbies right now that I've been enjoying is um, crocheting. So I do get to express um, some of my creativity in doing that. And I, um, you know, be in care careful in picking colors and picking um, the type of yarn I like to use. But I just decided that I wanted to start doing some macrame again. Talk about getting a throwback to the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, I, I have some plants. I'm trying to plant a garden out the back with some herbs and such. And I thought, oh, I'll just go do some hanging pots. So my um, creativity is now being expressed through macrame. So that'll be fun. Awesome. I can't wait to see what you come up with. <laughs> Thanks. So Abby, I know you're, you've been into a lot of different things lately. So what's one way that you've been able to express your creativity? Uh, well, when I saw that question immediately, I thought about food because um, I really don't enjoy leftovers, but you know, we're trying to limit how many times we go out to eat and how many times we're going to the grocery store. And so I think this has been like a, a great way to, for me to be creative with leftovers to repurpose them and make them feel like a brand new meal. Nice. I know I definitely have to start getting more creative with my leftovers because I'm starting to get tired of eating the same thing day after day. So we have a couple other people who have joined us. So I don't know if Sandy or Bernadette, you want to share a way that you like to express your creativity? Well, it's Sandy. Hi. Um, as sad as it, it seems, because I'm such a geek, I'm actually creating some new lessons for California Department of Education. And that requires an, an immense amount of creativity. Nice. But it's, it's geeky creativity. <laughs> this is Bernadette and like Sandy um, kind of like filling up my time with uh, trying to um, explore technology and seeing how I could then embed some of the things that I've done way way back uh, focusing on teaching mathematics for social justice so something like that could be in it, it interests me as to how I could do it differently, but more so creativity with my fifth grader at home. So she's doing a lot of things, crazy things, uh, from gardening to cooking, gosh, <laughs> to cleaning the house and so on and so forth. Yeah, lots of things to do, right? <laughs> yes. Definitely. Thank you for sharing. And we're going to think about all those creative things that we like to do and that we see our students doing at home. And how can we incorporate that into some of these uh, activities that we're asking our students to do while in distance learning? So I, in the title of this, I did mention universal design for learning. And in thinking about putting this this whole session together, I was really thinking about this, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole framework and guidelines behind it, although in my notes, I do link to that. So if you are curious about learning more about universal design for learning, I have a link to that in my notes. But 
in this session, I was really thinking about it as we talk about learner variability and how, you know, we're all different types of learners. We learn in all different ways. We have different types of passions. Um, so we're through creativity, we're going to address learner variability and then also thinking about the barriers, right? So we all have different home settings. We have, have different access to technology and tools that are available to us. So really being sensitive to different barriers that our learners might encounter. How can we address those things as we're trying to design some lessons that we give our students for distance learning? So my first strategy is to try some scavenger hunts with your students. And as I was going through Twitter and taking a look at different types of posts that people had put out there for scavenger hunts, I found some related to math. And I thought that this was really great because, you know, right now a lot of us are going out and we're going on walks and a lot of us have access to some sort of device that takes pictures. And so I found this tweet um, from Kelly Gardside and she said that she's on her walk and she's she's seeing all these arrays out there. So I just thought, well, wouldn't it be great just to get our students to start, if that was a standard that we we're trying to address, just to go out on a walk and, and take snap some photos of different types of arrays that they're seeing while, while they're out there on the walk, their walks. And it kind of reminded me of one of my sessions. I Creativity is one of my favorite things to really present on. And in one of my sessions, I would always go on a photo walk with my learners. And one of the things that I would have them collect would be letters, shapes, and textures. And so you can tie this to math, you can tie this to ELA and creating, creating really interesting stories. But for this one, um, I just had people go around. We were at a school, I think, in Concord for this session, and we just took pictures of different things and collected it all into one shared Google photo album. So, you know, this is a good way to collect images. Another idea would be to have just a Google Drive folder that you have your, you share with your students, like in Google Classroom, and you have them drop images that they're taking into that Google folder so that you can collect them all in one place. And, uh, another idea that I saw as I was looking at Twitter was just the way that some teachers are modeling these scavenger hunts for their students. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen Trisha Fugelstad on Instagram or Twitter, but she is so creative. I, she's an art teacher over in Illinois and she does these really great um, like uh, she has augmented reality. This pin tweet of her, she got stickers from Sticker Mule, and um, it's it's a, her, that picture is a trigger for us, um, a little animation that she had created. So this video right here that I'm about to show you is, let's see, an element of art in this scavenger hunt. So I'm gonna just play a little bit of it for you. Hi, this is Fugel Sam. We're going to go on a scavenger hunt around my house and look for the elements of art. Come and join me. I'm going to skip just a little bit. Listen close and you will hear the secret of great art. It's the intentional arrangement of the elements from the start. Because an artist needs to think about compositional design using color, shape, form, texture, value, space, and line. So let's go find them. Here's some color. These are bluebells growing in my yard. Take a look at the way the holes makes a whole bunch of shapes. They're like concentric circles and triangle things. I'd say the sh shed shows four. There's a front and a side. 
So I thought that was just a great example of a teacher modeling for her students exactly what they should be looking for on the scavenger hunt. And in this case, um, these elements of art. But really, you can relate it to any standard. You could take the vocabulary words that you're learning and, and have your students go on a scavenger hunt. Janet, and then, can I um, add some comments that have come through in the chat? Yeah, of course. Bernadette gives her big thumbs up of approval. She says how much she loves the visuals. Sandy added a comment that you could do this for science as well um, and looking for uh, solids, liquids, and gases and um, have your kids go through the house and find examples of those. And she gives some ideas in her chat about um, blowing bubbles in your milk with a straw or bubbles in soda, uh, steam from boiling water, and maybe um, gases that are come from your stove if you have a gas stove. So she gave some really fun examples in there on how to do that too. Yeah, how fun would it be to have your students create those examples, put it into a shared photo album or shared Google Drive, and you know, just take a look at it together and reflect on the things that you've seen. And so the last, the last idea that I kind of saw when I was doing a, a search on Twitter yesterday is like a Zoom or a Google Hangout scavenger hunt where you'd be on a live video call just like this and you just ask students to come back with you know, a different, a different shape. Right. So if we're looking for something that's a cylinder, then I can bring back this roll of tape. And uh, Abby and I are actually doing a, a makerspace course at Foothill College. And one of the activities that we were asked to do was just come back with just one object. And we could pick any object that we wanted. We came back and they put sent us out into breakout rooms and asked us just to tell a story with those three objects that each person brought into the room. And then we came back together as a group and we told a story. So there are a lot of creative things that you can do when it comes to scavenger hunts. So my first reflective question is what kind of scavenger hunt might apply to a standard that you teach? So we did kind of already I know Bernadette and Sandy shared some examples. Is there anything else maybe that we can think of in this group? Sandy shared another example about uh, looking for different plants and animals out the window. Um, identify whether they're a producer, a consumer, um, a decomposer, and uh, create a little food web in your backyard. Ooh, interesting. And Bernadette, did you have something? Yeah, also, uh, I have a fifth grader at home right now, and um, I like your idea about the scavenger hunt via Zoom. So maybe uh, at one point they're learning about a surface area right now. And so if a teacher shows, okay, show me the surface area of a cube or of a particular solid or things like that, so they can grab uh, samples within you know at home to showcase that uh, showing a teacher an understanding of a surface area of a particular solid so that I, I, I like it I like I like it <laughs> great ideas uh, my brain is just offering <laughs> with a lot of ideas right now I never thought about the photo walks I mean uh, we've been walking every day morning and afternoon the one thing that I've my daughter and I are doing is a comparison of sunrise and sunset of the same um, of the same picture, and so then we can compare colors and shapes and um, angles and things like that. But I love it, love it. <laughs> this isn't exactly a, a scavenger hunt, but um, it's related and totally tool specific, but there's an app that I learned about recently. It's called, I think it's iNaturalist. And it's similar to Pokemon Go, where you're collecting um, different flowers and plants that you see, but you basically take a picture of a plant and it identifies it for you. And then it indexes it for you in what would be your like plant Rolodex or whatever, like Pokemon Go. So you're like collecting the different plants and animals or bugs that you see. Um, which you can do even in your house. You can like take pictures of the spider and it'll identify it for you. So I think that's similar, but not exactly 
a Did scavenger you, hunt. I naturalist, uh, Abby. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's an so app. you can, yeah, it's an app. You can take it on your walks with your daughter. Thank you. Oh, I, I love the idea about being outside more than anything and to take the picture of yourself and, and look for those shapes and the textures and such. Um, but I have seen teachers use Google arts and culture, um, the museums to do very similar things to take them, take their students through an art exhibit and have them find different shapes or textures um, and ex expo in that case, exposing them to the art as well. Those are all really great ideas. And, you know, Bernadette, I'm really thinking about, this is such a great opportunity for math. This is why I'm, I, this excites me really a lot because it, it's now starting to get us to really think about the math and, that lies in the world around us, right? I just remember going through math and just thinking that it was all about just giving, give me the formula and I can solve the problem, you know, but I never really saw this real world application and now I'm really starting to see it all around me now that you know we're stuck at home to kind of really have to force to be creative about the way that we're learning about things so super excited about that which kind of leads me into my next strategy is just to find that inspiration that's all around you and i mentioned that kci um, makerspace class it's actually a computer science class that we're taking right now and so one of the challenges that we were asked to do was the getty challenge so i don't know if you've seen this one before but it's just you know take a look at the getty museum just like karen had mentioned and get inspired and see if you can recreate art um, that you see online so here's some examples and you know uh, in, in trying to do this, I totally see how this applies to computer science thinking, computational thinking, because I kind of had to, when I was doing this challenge, and this is an example of my recreation, this is my dog right here, Livingston, I was trying to think, well, what do I have access to with me right now? What kind of materials do I have in my house? Well, I, my dog. So let me see, let me just search all of the dog images and see if I can find one that's kind of similar. And then, you know me, I love, I love my iPad and sketching on my iPad. So I kind of recreated the background in um, Adobe Sketch. And then I used Photoshop Mix to place my dog right in front of it. And that was my recreation. I know Abby has a really good one too. So um, <laughs> maybe I can get her to share it uh, and we can put it in the notes later. But that was one of my ideas. And then speaking of these real world math problems, we could relate it to pictures that we're finding on our photo walks and create math problems out of them. And before all of this started happening, I have this extension that's this Unsplash um, it's just a, in the Chrome Web Store, it's Unsplash. So every time I open up a new tab, I get a new Unsplash image. Well, anytime I open up my tab and I get something that inspires some ma mathematical thinking, I take it and I stick it into this Google Drive folder just for myself because I think that, you know, it, it, inspi it inspires a lot of questions for me, but then I start thinking about, well, what kind of math problems can I ask when I look at these kinds of questions? So a lot of these, and I've also included some of my own images in here, but most of these are actually unsplashed images, but you know, I can see some estimation related questions. I see some um, questions about maybe area, and a lot of, I have a lot of images of architecture. So I had this idea of like, could you get your students to start taking snapping pictures or finding pictures and then asking mathematical questions. So um, that was one of these ideas that I had inspired by these unsplash photos, lots of different shapes uh, and different kinds of lines. And then I, my last idea was just to really spark creative stories. And Apple has their Everyone Can Create 
and they have everyone can create music, drawing, coding. They have a coding lesson. They have photography. So no matter what your students might be into, you actually might be able to get some really great inspiration. Even if you're not using Apple products, they have some great lessons in there just to spark a lot of creativity. And um, I went, I don't, I think, I don't know where I got this tomato. Somebody brought this tomato home for me and I knew I knew I should just take a picture of it. I, I don't have any more. I think I, I definitely used it, but before I used it, I took a picture of it because I'm like, this will make a great photo that I can, I can use for this same activity to personify something. And then I can use it for a really creative story that I can get into. So, you know, if you can find some inspiration around you, I think you can start to connect the learning possibilities. So my question, my food for thought question is, what is something found in your home that has inspired new learning? Or if you have any thoughts related to any of those ideas that I just shared with you. Something that always comes to mind when I see kids being able to take pictures or using their own photos is just that digital literacy piece about um, you know being a good digital citizen and uh, not having to use the work of others but using your own work and getting kids into the habit of knowing that they don't have to depend on the work of others to be inspired or do something creative or do math or you know do these lessons that they can do it themselves and start building that confidence and that. Um, that spark of creativity on their own. And I'm thinking that in upper grades, as you're really starting to learn about what goes into different genres, you can use what you find around the house um, to craft your stories around. And that can be kind of fun sometimes because your heroine might be a salt shaker. Yeah. <laughs> Or a tomato. Because what would, what would your dinner taste like without her to the rescue? Come on. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, on the uh, in the chat box, I actually uh, shared uh, what my daughter has been doing in terms of journaling, uh, mathematics in the kitchen, mathematics in the backyard, uh, uh, mathematics in developing or putting organic fertilizer for some plants uh, in the backyard, math on the road, or things like that, um, because. It's just empowering to what you've mentioned, right? I mean, different students or different families have different things at home. So how can we utilize the things that we have at home to engage our kids in some ways that they could truly appreciate, in my, in my, in my case, through the lens of mathematics. So it's always been awesome to see my Ailey, uh, you know, doing all these different things. And yeah, she's just, you know, she's learning volume and statistics and um, algebra and things like that. So it's just amazing to um, rethink the way we are providing um, learning opportunities for our kids. And hopefully a lot of our teachers are, you know, um, trying to reimagine the lessons that they're trying to provide for kids as well to then uh, not just teach a lesson, but create an experience to use what they have at home to engage kids more meaningfully about the uh, concepts that they're trying to teach. Yeah, I love that. And thank you for sharing that. I mean, uh, as I'm looking at it, she has math in the kitchen, math in the backyard, um, with some organic furniture, fertilizer, and math on the road, math with my sister. That <laughs> is awesome. Camping in the yeah. family room. <laughs> so the I love is, it. Yeah. And even just, just, just the scientific method of this particular set of procedures didn't work. So let me try for trial number two. And today they're trying to do trial number three for mm -hmm. banana bread, <laughs> which yes. they haven't per perfected it so well. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so Bernadette, what's missing is that science piece where everybody has to taste it and provide data. 
<laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that that's a great tip. My, uh, my friend who's a baker, she says that when you're trying something out, you record everything. And for a while, I was trying, we're trying to perfect um, this steamed bao recipe. And so every time I try and take pictures and I try and record all of the measurements and everything so that, and it's a really hard one to perfect because the temperature really plays a factor in all of it as well. So that I love that you're doing that with your daughter. And then my last tip or my last strategy is just choice boards. I see lots of choice boards out there. I, in the link for my notes um, and linked in this slide, there's a Google Drive folder with different types of choice boards. This one come, came out from Apple's Everyone Can Create, 30 Creative Activities for Kids. I'm gonna show you, um, well, this is an art one but one that seems to be really popular because every time I come on here, there's a lot of people on this document. This one is interdisciplinary STEAM activities at home. And so you'll find some really great creative activities for your students to do related to any science, uh, any subject or content area. And I was just going to click on a couple of them, but they have some really cool ones that I forgot about like virtual tours. So I've actually, it's been a while, but I have played around with this tool because you can actually make your, create your own virtual, your own tool, tour in this tool, using this tool. But it's really great to get some inspiration by clicking on some of these. And oops, let me go back to this one. And then, you know, create a mathematical comic. Uh, create a historical timeline. I know we haven't talked too much of, about social studies, but there are lots of different tools out there. So you can find lots of things on different types of choice boards. And I have an example um, in this folder here. Actually, this is a pretty interesting one. I found one that's self-care STEAM. So, and these are just all linked to videos that you can watch where you can start to just create some things in your house. So, lots of great ideas that, that educators are putting out there on Twitter. And I had this example of an end of the year Adobe Spark challenge that I had done. It's just a one tech tool, so using Adobe Spark, and then I was just giving lots of different creative choices about, you know, what they can create a video or a Spark page about. And I was thinking about this one specifically because it was the end of the year, and, you know, it's a good time to reflect back on things that happened over the year. So with any of these Google uh, docs or slides, you can always just make a copy and then you, and modify it for your, for whatever standard you want to meet, whatever content area. Uh, and then I'm asking, is Adobe Spark free? It is free. And I did link in the notes uh, the page for Spark for Education. So if your district has set it up where they've given you your Adobe Spark accounts, um, then all of your students can actually use their, uh, their Google logins. If it hasn't been set up at your district, there's actually a link on that page. And um, I don't have it up right now, but it has a video for how you can just use a shared account for younger students. So, that information is in the show notes, but it is free. And it's one of the easiest digital tools that I've used for making, for making video. Um, so easy that we were getting a lot of kindergarten uh, students to use that tool. And if you have questions about more about different creation tools, I have linked to this Hyperdoc, I don't know if I want to call it a hyperdoc or this choice board of different tools 
so if you're looking for tools to create a comment or comic or maybe you want your students to do some podcasting what I have some apps that are good for mobile devices ones that are good for the web and then anytime that you see this little check mark that's the common sense symbol so you could get a common sense review of that tool so this is a good resource if you're looking for different digital tools that you might want to try out with your students so my final question is what's one takeaway from that you have from today's conversation i know we've we've talked about a <laughs> lot of these things one all mg it's <laughs> amazing I can't wait to try I would say yeah you're right I mean one at the time and I think that um, as I you know um, experience productive struggle I'm not into tech so much but I am so happy to learn one tech tool at a time and play it with my fifth grader so thank you so much love it Thank you, Bernadette. I think for me, it's getting out, getting kids outside and discovering what's outside and how, or in your kitchen or in your home, you know, how does that support your learning? Um, and hoping that teachers, you know, take advantage of that, you know, pretty accessible resource to help kids um, see learning all around them. Yeah, I agree, Karen, yeah. Mm -hmm. One aha I had um, as you were talking about all of the strategies was that in any lesson, there's like language that's already tied to the lesson. But when you access students' creativity or their own images, they get to dictate what that language is to some extent. And so I think it only empowers students to be able to give them that like space to have ownership, but also create some of the rules around what that language and what's entered into the learning. One idea that um, that I noticed is that when you allow the learning to originate in the home, it tends to be more cross cross content areas. Mm -hmm. And then I'm hoping the teachers can pull that out to make kids and parents realize it. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing your thoughts and ideas. I think we just do have this exciting unique opportunity right now i mean we might as well try and make the most out of it and i think by allowing students to to be creative then we can start to see all of these new possibilities for creative possibilities for learning that are happening all around us so thank you for joining all of the information for these webinars, the upcoming ones, and archived episodes can all be found at our site. So uh, bit.ly slash sccoe vlog, V-L-O-G. And then I have my notes page linked here. And coming up, it's really exciting. We have a history social science judicial judiciary series that Laura has set up. So please join us for the next three webinars and um, we'd love to have you participate. And if you have any questions, you can contact me. And I just want to thank all of you for being here and participating with me today. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you.